so much. Thank you all. It is so great to be back in Pittsburgh. And it is especially great to be here with the men and women of the IBEW. I want to thank Mike Dunleavy and IBEW Local 5 for welcoming us to your house. We are happy to be here. And I want to thank my longtime friend, colleague, advocate, Leo Gerard, who has been a champion, not just for steel workers, but for working people, fairness, the kind of economy that lifts everybody up for as long as I've known him. I am so grateful to have the support of both the steel workers and IBEW. It means a lot to me because we want to put you all to work. We're going to have a lot of work to do in our country and nobody can do it better. I want to recognize your county executive, Rich Fitzgerald, and thank him for being such a great supporter, but more than that, for leading this county along with uh, Mayor Bill Peduto, who has done such a great job to continue the renaissance uh, of Pittsburgh. And I want to join Leo in acknowledging your great Congressman Mike Doyle and your great Senator Bob Casey. There's another mayor here, Mayor John Fetterman from, uh, yeah, John is here. John is hard to miss, so he's here somewhere. I saw him earlier. I want to thank uh, also City Councilwoman uh, Natalia Rudiak, and I want to thank Josh Shapiro, your candidate for Attorney General, and a Montgomery County Commissioner, Reverend James Edward Brown, and all of you for being with us today. I always love coming to Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania. And it's especially great to be here after the Penguins clinch the Stanley Cup again. It's quite a, quite a record now. They got some ways to go before they match the Steelers in terms of, you know, winning it all, but they're on their way. And uh, the County Executive and I were talking, and uh, he said something which really struck me. Uh, the Penguins uh, did this the old-fashioned way, teamwork, hard work, and resilience. And that's what we're going to do in this election, and that, that's what we're going to do in our country. Now, when I planned this trip, um, I intended to give a different talk today about how we make our economy work for everyone, not just those at the top how we reduce economic inequality that is threatening not just our economy, but our democracy, how we rebuild our infrastructure, stand with our steel workers against illegal dumping by China. And I wanted to talk too about how unions like IBEW and the steel workers and so many others helped build the greatest middle class in the world. If, every, if anybody has a chair, you can, you can use it because, don't worry, the folks behind you have sat down and everybody is seated. That's great. <laughs> you see, I, I draw from our history that labor is central to whatever we want to achieve. And I'm going to be a strong partner and advocate for the American labor movement, for working people, for your rights and your opportunities to make the very best possible living in the greatest country on earth. And these are the issues that are in my heart. I will be talking about them in the weeks ahead. They're really at the center of my campaign. But today, there are different things on my mind and probably on yours too, as Leo said. We are all still reeling from what happened on Sunday in Orlando. Another terrorist attack, not overseas, but here at home. So many Americans killed and wounded. 
a hate crime at an LGBT nightclub right in the middle of Pride Month, the deadliest mass shooting in the history of the United States. And the losses stretch all the way to Pennsylvania. Two of the victims were from this state. Akira Murray, a high school basketball star from Philadelphia, was killed. She was just 18 years old. And her friend, Patience Carter, also from Philadelphia, was shot. It's a poignant reminder that even in a country as big as ours, we are all connected. And our hearts are with Patience and Akria's families and all the families who are grieving now. Since Sunday, we've been trying to make sense of what happened and what we together can do to prevent future attacks. Yesterday in Cleveland, I once again laid out my plan for defeating ISIS and the broader radical jihadist movement around the world and online, and for combating radicalization here at home, including a special focus on detecting and preventing so-called lone wolf attacks like we saw in Orlando and San Bernardino. These attacks are carried out by individuals who may or may not have any direct contact with an organization like ISIS, but are inspired primarily over the internet by its twisted ideology. I reemphasized the importance of working with Muslim communities here at home who are often the most likely to recognize radicalization before it's too late. After the attacks in Paris, Brussels, and San Bernardino, I met with Homeland Security officials and Muslim community leaders in Minneapolis and Los Angeles to hear their ideas for building stronger partnerships. We need to lift up voices of moderation and tolerance. And I also said something I've been saying from the very beginning of this campaign. I believe we Americans are capable of both protecting our Second Amendment rights while making sure guns don't fall into the wrong hands. And <laughs> the terrorist in Orlando was the definition of the wrong hands. And weapons of war have no place in our streets. So the questions being debated this week about how we deal with the threat of terrorism are some of the most charged and important issues we face. And there are bound to be differences of opinion in a country as diverse and complex as ours, I think that's a given. But I believe that despite those differences of opinion, on a deeper level, we are all on the same team. We may not see eye to eye on everything, but we are all Americans. And there is so much more that unites us than divides us. I, I have said many times, I think it's appropriate for us not to consider ourselves on the Republican team or the Democratic team, the red team or the blue team, but to be on the American team. And after a terrible event like Orlando, that is clearer than ever. And that's what we're seeing in Orlando and across America. People of different faiths, backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities coming together to say with one voice, we won't let hate defeat us. If we can count on that kind of unity and solidarity from each other, if even the families of the Orlando victims are speaking out right now against hate and division, we should certainly expect that from our leaders. And I am sorry to say that is not what we are hearing from Donald Trump.
Donald Trump wants to be our next commander in chief. I think we all know that that is a job that demands a calm, collected, and dignified response to these kinds of events. Instead, yesterday morning, just one day after the massacre, he went on TV and suggested that President Obama is on the side of the terrorists. Now, now just think about that for a second. Even in a time of divided politics, this is way beyond anything that should be said by someone running for President of the United States. And I have to ask, will responsible Republican leaders stand up to their presumptive nominee? Or will they stand by his accusation about our President? Now, I am sure they'd rather avoid that question altogether. But history will remember what we do in this moment. What Donald Trump is saying is shameful. It is disrespectful to the people who were killed and wounded and their families. And it is yet more evidence that he is temperamentally unfit and totally unqualified to be commander in chief. Of course, he is a leader of the birther movement, which spread the lie that President Obama wasn't born in the United States. I guess he had to be reminded Hawaii is part of the United States. <laughs> This is a man who claimed a distinguished federal judge, born and raised in Indiana, can't do his job because of his, quote, Mexican heritage. I guess he has to be reminded, Indiana is in the United States. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised. But it was one thing when he was a reality TV personality. You know, raising his arms and yelling, you're fired. <laughs> it is another thing altogether when he is the Republican Party's presumptive nominee for president. Americans, we don't need conspiracy theories and pathological self-congratulations. We need leadership, common sense, and concrete plans because we are facing a brutal enemy. In the Middle East, ISIS is attempting a genocide of religious and ethnic minorities. They're slaughtering Muslims who refuse to accept their medieval ways. They are beheading civilians, including executing LGBT people, murdering Americans and Europeans, enslaving, torturing, and raping women and girls. The barbarity we face from radical jihadists is profound. So I would like to have a worthy debate on the best way to keep our country safe. That's what Americans deserve. Now I read every word of Donald Trump's speech yesterday and I sifted through all of the bizarre rants and the outright lies and what I found once you cut through the nonsense, is that his plan comes down to two things. First, he is fixated on the words radical Islam. Now, I must say, I find this strange. Is Donald Trump suggesting that there are magic words that once uttered will stop terrorists from coming after us? <laughs> now, Trump, as usual, is obsessed with name-calling. And from my perspective, it matters what we do, 
not just what we say. In the end, it didn't matter what we called bin Laden. It mattered that we got bin Laden. I have clearly said that we faced terrorist enemies who use a perverted version of Islam to justify slaughtering innocent people. We have to stop them, and we will. So if Donald suggests I won't call this threat what it is, he hasn't been listening. But I will not demonize and declare war on an entire religion. And Now that we are past the semantic debate, Donald's going to have to come up with something better. He's got one other idea. He wants to ban all Muslims from entering our country. And now he wants to go even further and suspend all immigration from large parts of the world. Now, I've talked before about how this approach is un-American. It goes against everything we stand for as a country, founded on religious freedom. But it is also dangerous. First, we rely on partners in Muslim countries to fight terrorists. This would make it harder. Second, we need to build trust in Muslim communities here at home to counter radicalization. And this would make it harder. Third, Trump's words will be, in fact, they already are, a recruiting tool for ISIS to help them increase its ranks of people willing to do what we saw in Orlando. And fourth, he's turning Americans against Americans, which is exactly what ISIS wants. Leaders who've actually fought terrorists know this. General Petraeus said recently, that demonizing a religious faith and its adherence will come at a great cost, not just to our values, but to our men and women in uniform and our national security. Commissioner Bill Bratton of the New York Police Department said, this kind of talk makes his job harder. He has Muslims in his police force, he has Muslims in the community, he needs everybody working together against any potential threat. But Donald won't listen to any of this, not experts like General Petraeus or Commissioner Bratton or anybody, because he says he knows more about ISIS than the generals do. <laughs> it's almost hard to even think of what to say about that claim. <laughs> But in this instance, Donald's words are especially nonsensical because the terrorist who carried out this attack wasn't born in Afghanistan, as Donald Trump said yesterday. He was born in Queens, New York, just like Donald was himself. So Muslim bans and immigration reforms would not have stopped him. They would not have saved a single life in Orlando. And those are the only two ideas Donald Trump put forward yesterday for how to fight ISIS. Beyond that, he said a lot of false things, including about me. He said, I'll abolish the Second Amendment. Well, that's wrong. He said, I'll let a flood of refugees into our country without any screening. That's also wrong. These are demonstrably lies but he feels compelled to tell them because he has to distract us from the fact he has nothing substantive to say for himself. <laughs> now, much of the rest of his speech was spent denigrating not just the president, 
but the efforts of all the brave American service members, law enforcement agents, intelligence officers, diplomats, and others who have worked so hard to keep our country safe. Donald says our military is a disaster and the world is laughing at us. Wrong again. Since 9-11, America has done a great deal at home and abroad to stop terrorists. Thousands of Americans have fought and died. We have worked intensively with our allies, engaged in fierce and vital debates here at home about how far our government should go in monitoring threats. We have vastly increased security measures at airports, train stations, power plants, and many other places. And the American people, we have all become more vigilant, even while we have carried on living our lives as normally as possible. It has been a long and difficult effort. We've had successes and we've also had failures. But one thing's for sure, the fight against terrorism has never been simple. And we need a commander in chief who's up to these challenges, who can grapple with them in all their complexity. Someone with real plans and real solutions that actually address the problems we face. And we need. And we need someone with the temperament and experience to make those hard choices in the Situation Room, not a loose cannon who could easily lead us into war. Now, one more thing. Donald Trump has been very clear about what he won't do. He won't stand up to the gun lobby. The terrorist who killed 49 people and wounded 53 others in Orlando did it with two guns, a handgun and a Sig Sauer MCX rifle. If you don't know what that is, I urge you to Google it. See it for yourself. This man had been investigated by the FBI for months, but we couldn't stop him from buying a powerful weapon that he used to slaughter Americans in large numbers. Let's get this straight. We have reached the point where people cannot board airplanes with full bottles of shampoo. <laughs> but people being watched by the FBI for suspected terrorist links can buy a gun with no questions asked. That is absurd. <laughs> it just seems like Western Pennsylvania common sense. If you're too dangerous to get on a plane, you are too dangerous to buy a gun. <laughs> enough is enough. So now is time for seriousness and resolve. We need to go after ISIS overseas. We need to protect Americans here at home, counter their poisonous ideology, support our first responders, take a hard look at our gun laws, Stand with the LGBT community and peaceful Muslim Americans today and always. In the days and weeks ahead, I will have more to say about how we work together to keep our country and our citizens safe and take the fight to the terrorists. None of this will be easy and none of it will be helped by anything that Donald Trump has to offer. This is the time to set aside fear and division and reach for unity. America is strongest when we all feel like we have a stake in our country, when we all have a chance to live up to our God-given potential, and we want others here to have that chance too. We've always been a country of we, not me, and we've always been stronger together. We are stronger when people can participate in our democracy, share in the rewards of our economy, and contribute to our communities when we bridge our divides and lift each other up instead of tearing each other down. Here in Pennsylvania and across America, I have listened to so many people tell me 
about the problems that keep you and your families up at night. Despite all the progress we've made, there's not yet enough growth which creates good jobs and raises incomes. There's not yet enough economic fairness so everyone who works hard can share in the rewards. We need both a growth and fairness economy where profits and paychecks rise together. And <clears throat> so many people have talked to me about how the bonds that hold us together as one national community are being strained by too much inequality, too little upward mobility, social and political divisions that have diminished our trust in each other and our confidence in our shared future. As your president, I'll work every day to break down all the barriers holding you back and keeping us apart. And I will be on your side. I'll have the back Leo of every steel worker getting knocked around by unfair competition, of every working mom trying to raise her kids on minimum wage or unequal pay, of every union member struggling to keep going in the face of concerted attacks on workers' rights. Because right to work is wrong for workers, and we need to stand strong with unions. <laughs> Together, I want us to forge a new sense of connection and shared responsibility to each other and our nation. I know that's possible because I have seen it throughout our history, including just this week. Some of you may have noticed a letter that went viral on the internet over the past few days. The letter is from George H. W. Bush's presidential library. I hadn't read it in a long time until yesterday. And it moved me to tears, just like it did all those years ago. It's the letter that President Bush left in the Oval Office for my husband back in January of 1993. They had just fought a fierce campaign. Bill won, President Bush lost. In a democracy, that's how it goes. But when Bill walked into that office for the very first time as president, that note was waiting for him. It had some good advice about staying focused on what mattered despite the critics. It wished him happiness, and it concluded with these words. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success is now our country's success, and I am rooting hard for you, George. That's the America we love. That is what we cherish and expect. So let us come together. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We can root for each other's success, where our president is everyone's president and our future belongs to us all. Let's make this once again the big-hearted, fair-minded country we all love so much. Thank you all very, very much.